Salam alaikum. It really is an honor to be with you tonight. I have been in Washington for two and a half years, and quite honestly, I really love the place, but I don't have the community that I had at Emory, um, where I had the great joy of celebrating the holy days of Ramadan uh, with the Muslim community. So this invitation tonight is especially sweet for me. So uh, Aisha, thank you so much. Uh, it really is an honor to be with you tonight. and. Um, to celebrate the work of 25 years that Karama has done uh, and on this holy night of Ramadan, which I know is such an important night for you and in some ways for me as well. Um, I want to tell you a few things about myself and about my work. Um, I have sort of the advantage now of looking back and being able to think about it a little bit. But from my parents, I received a blessing that I would never know how great it really was. Um, my parents, as you can tell, I'm from the South, right? <laughs> That's not a secret. Um, but from my parents who lived in North and South Carolina, they were a little unusual. They were a little more cosmopolitan than many families uh, often in the South were in those days and had traveled uh, in some ways and helped instill in me a love that has guided me for many, many years. And that love was of people and friends and cultures and religions that were not white, Anglo, Protestant, Christian, middle class. So in my life, it was always people who did not look like me that were more interesting to me. And so as I grew up in North and South Carolina, I was always sort of drawn to places and people that I really did not know or would not be so, um, I guess, associated with kind of normally. And that was a very important things and thing for me. And I would say for all of you, um, and I know that Muslims are in the minority in America right now, but it is, and you have to understand culture in a different way than somebody who is white and privileged uh, in this country understands cultures and relationships, which is an advantage in some ways because you see it in different ways that are really important. But helping instill a love for those who are not like ourselves is really important, particularly for white privilege. And it has been something that I have dedicated my life to, not because I felt obligated, but because I loved it. And that is one of the marks of who I am and how I came to do what I have done in these years. In 1991, I went to Emory as the Dean of the Chapel in Religious Life, and there, um, started an MSA association, which I think is one of the best ones in the country, actually. <laughs> I'm a little biased um, about that. And, um, but was very committed from the very beginning for it not to be, in many ways, what chaplaincy and religious organizations often was at that time and still is today, which in many universities, private institutions that were historically church related, which held Christianity at the center and was hospitable and gracious to others, uh, but the table was not completely round. Um, and from a pretty early point in my life at Emory, I was committed to helping the table be round so that the voices were equal. Now in those days, and I won't go into all of that right now, but. In those days, there were far more Christians and far fewer Muslims than there are today. Uh, but the table is rounder, and one of the things that by the time I left two years ago that we had done was to say that not only was, were there one or two Muslim voices or one or two Hindu voices or one or two Jewish voices in the midst of a Christian table, but that uh, there were four or five Muslim voices and four or five Hindu voices and four or five Jewish voices and so forth and so on, so that you have the diversity within the diversity that is so important. Um, 
The other thing that we did very early on, and this was controversial, as Aisha can tell you, uh, but from the beginning, we tried to create um, equitable prayer space. And so that really from the beginning, men and women prayed side by side. By the time I left, I think the thing that I was most proud of was that in Cannon Chapel, which was not specifically built to be Christian space, but it was truly built to be in multi-faith space. And there were no Christian symbols in the space unless you brought them to the space. Um, we had prayer with women and men side by side, and we had ablution rooms uh, for men and women that were equal, the same size, and with all the accoutrements. So uh, equity for gender was really important uh, in the work that we did there. Um, by the time of 9-11, as Aisha has said, when she came uh, and that fall, I guess you'd been there two weeks maybe when 9-11 happened. And it was a terrible moment, but it was also a teaching moment in the life of this country that has had many ups and downs, as you already know. Uh, I remember it at the time of Thanksgiving, which was two months after 9-11, that there were many students that had difficult, Muslim students, who had difficulty when they went to the airport to get their flights to go home, if they were going to Florida or to Texas or to New York or to wherever. Um, there was beginning then to be so much stereotyping and so much anxiety and fear that was really hard to see and to help young students who were 18 years old began to think about how do I live in this world that I never expected to have to live. Um, time and time again, I happily wrote letters for students to get into graduate school and to federal programs and to many other things. But often, at, from time to time, I would have to write two or three letters for a student saying, yes, not only is this an extremely accomplished student, but this is an extremely, extremely, extraordinarily accomplished student uh, because of the biases in the culture that we're beginning um, to make their way uh, through. Creating space for women was very important. Um, the cre creating space for men, Muslim men and Muslim women was really important. And in many traditions, um, well, <laughs> there are many issues related to gender, but uh, <laughs> helping be sure that there was both a place for presence and for voice. Uh, from the very beginning so that it's part of the level playing field that everybody had access to it was a, ch a challenge at times but it was a great joy because that is how really and truly empowerment happens is when from the very beginning space and place is created uh, that's not an add-on. Um, the voices of the Interreligious Council were very important and um, that was also important in now, as in those days, to be a presence in a world that is very secular and sometimes very suspicious of religion. So helping give integrity to each of the religious traditions is really important, and having that be an equitable kind of sharing of uh, the importance of religion uh, was and continues to be very important. Um, on my phone, I. I don't, I don't have a way to project this, but I want to pass around a photograph. A couple, okay, this is, you know, if I had to have one photograph, this would be it. This, was, this is it. Um, in, in 2013, I took a group um, to New York and we were visiting a number of sites. We went to the Baha'i community and we went to a mosque and we went to uh, a Christian community. We went to the Hebrew uh, seminary and saw an art exhibit and we did many things. And on this particular rainy day in March, we went to the 9-11 site uh, after we met at the cultural center. And I happened upon this photograph, which you will see. There were four students who I loved very much. Uh, Nuang, who was Buddhist, Sahar, who was Muslim, uh, Makal, who was Jewish, and Rebecca, who was Christian. And they had approached the site at the 9-11 um, memorial. And they were just standing there. And I overheard one of them say to the other, 
we're here, what should we do? <laughs> and one of them said, I think we should pray. And this is a photograph of them standing there. And it was like <laughs> nobody could ha ever have made that photograph happen. <laughs> but it was like a perfect world kind of in that day standing at that memorial site. So uh, the importance of uh, creating an equitable table where the voices and the presence of men and women and young people are there is really important. A um, couple more things that I want to say, and I just want you to know this because I know some, to some degree, some of the pain that the Muslim community and communities have suffered uh, in the past years, but there are those of us who are Christian that believe in the importance of uh, all the world's religions and the validity and the integrity of all of those religions. And so this week I wrote a statement, as I do from time to time, about what happened on Sunday. I wrote first about the LGBT community and then I wrote about the Muslim community reminding my Christian brothers and sisters with whom I interact. There are about seven million uh, United Methodists in the United States and about um, a total of 12 million around the world. And I said, persons from any culture who are radicalized must not be allowed to claim the integrity of the world's great religious traditions. As persons of faith, we must stand with all religious persons and communities who seek peace, compassion, and a brighter future for all, which is the work that we and you are all engaged in that is so important. Last of all, um, I want to say how important it is that women's voices are critical, not just because they're women's voices, but for the work of justice and peace. The work of justice and peace is the work that now is ahead of us uh, throughout the world, and it is a very important um, and fun sometimes, actually, <laughs> job to be engaged in the work of justice and peace. But that cannot happen without women. Uh, the world has to have the voices of all men and women, and they have to be treasured and cherished and given pl and places have to be there for women to speak um, and to live out their lives and to help make the world a better and more just and more peaceful place. Um, I found a quote, some of you have probably read the book uh, by M Malala, but there is a quote of one of the characters in her book that is really, I think, poignant and helpful for us tonight. And she says, no struggle can ever succeed without the full participation of women side by side with men. There are two powers in the world. One is the sword the other is the pen. The third power that is stronger than both is that of women. <laughs> Thank you very much for receiving me tonight and many blessings on you in these days.